continuing our series on dysfunctional families of the Bible today, and uh, we are going to be talking about Joseph and his brothers. There are many, many options when thinking about dysfunctional families of the Bible, uh, but today we're talking about siblings. So hear the words from Genesis 45, just a small snippet of the story of Joseph and his brothers. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Sibling rivalry. A rivalry potentially more intense than that of any football team. <laughs> Virtually no rivalry that is more long-lasting, more complicated, or more heated. Experts say that sibling rivalry between adults is one of the most harmful and least addressed issues in families. Research studies indicate up to 45% of, adult, uh, of adults have rivalrous or distant relationships with siblings. Rivalry often persists in adulthood because it goes unaddressed so much of the time. Well, as uh, luck would have it, ironically, today I am the one who is addressing sibling rivalry. I have no siblings. <laughs> I am an only child of an only child of an only child. Uh, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Spoil. Um, yeah. I do not have any first-hand knowledge of sibling rivalry. I have seen it, though, in my families. As a matter of fact, when my second son was born, my parents, there he is right there, uh, my parents were at the hospital, my dad holding my son, overjoyed, of course, but he just looks at me and he says, why did he need two? I'm terrified at this point. I look to my mother, who has three siblings, and I said, what have I done to say her? And she said, oh, you're enriching his life. I'm not sure he would yet agree, nine years later, that I'm enriching his life by giving him siblings. Most of what I learned about sibling rivalry before I had my own children to deal with, was from my husband and his family. He has two older sisters, and uh, most of their <coughs> most of uh, most of their sibling rivalry is limited to good-natured kidding. As a matter of fact, I was just telling Dave, um, you know, there's always the deal about who's the favorite, right? And Brantley says that that has been determined pretty readily in his household because. His mom ordered senior pictures of each of them. His sister, oldest sister, and then the middle sister. Well, when it came time to order Brantley's picture, you know, she was so over it. She forgot what size she had ordered, so she ordered his bigger than his sister's. So now we have this giant senior picture of Brantley. So he says, just look, who's the favor, right? And uh, I heard so many stories, you know, when I came into the family, uh, especially Brant's middle sister. Uh, he and Wendy, you know, went back and forth. She inflicted so much upon him. Uh, she would do things like, you know, they knew they weren't supposed to get in the creek. She would say, why don't you go get in the creek? You know? And so as adults, I heard her, you know, apologize to him for all the things that she had done to him. And um, she died of breast cancer in 2009. Just before she died, she asked for Brantley to say something funny at her funeral. 
And as he got up to speak at her funeral, he said that, you know, Wendy had done all these things to him when they were children. And he suspected this was her way of one more time trying to get him in trouble. <laughs> Siblings can do a lot to each other, for good and for bad. We see sibling rivalry in the stories of many biblical families, but few are more famous than this one of epic proportion reached by Joseph and his brothers. Joseph's brothers hated him so much that they had to get rid of him. They ended up, of course, selling him into slavery. You, you might remember the story. Quite frankly, Joseph gave them pretty good reason to feel that way. It's, I think it's interesting when we think about sibling rivalry between Joseph and his brothers because there was so much rivalry between their mothers. You remember the story? Rachel and Leah, how they were always vying for Jacob's attention. And this carried out in the lives of the siblings as well. Their children fought. Leah, jealous of the extra affection that Rachel received, Rachel jealous of Leah's many children. The attention that was showered upon Joseph brought the ire of all of his brothers. That brightly colored jacket, the things that Joseph did that did not endear himself to his siblings. A recipe for disaster. But God was at work working together for good. All the things that Joseph's brothers had done intended evil. After that loud mouth obnoxious little brother was sold into slavery, you might remember he experienced some highs and some lows. He began to work his way up in Potiphar's house, remember? But then an little unfortunate episode with Potiphar's wife Landed him back in prison. But from there, he began to work his way up again. Finally, finding himself second in command over all of Egypt, helping prepare them for an upcoming famine. And due to God's hand at work, he was able to provide for his father and his brothers. Finally, in today's scripture, we see Joseph reveal his identity. Let his brothers know who he was. And after all that the brothers had put him through, don't you think it took a lot? It took a lot for him to forgive them, to tell them who he was. But not only did he forgive them, he told them about how God's hand had been at work. And see, if you hadn't done this, I wouldn't be here now, able to help provide for you in your time of need. It sounds simple, right? Forgive, let the past be the past. Oh yes, God worked all this out beautifully. So never mind that little part about you selling me into slavery. It's interesting what siblings do to each other. This week I asked the question of folks, what is the worst part and what are the best parts of having siblings? I received quite a few humorous responses, but I also, I love this one, the moment he realized he was now the middle child. <laughs> I also received many stories that told of heartbreak families being torn apart. As a matter of fact, just last night in my own dinner table, we had a little discussion that I thought illustrated the sibling issues very well. My boys were kind of fussing with each other, and so we told them they needed to say something nice about each other. What is one good quality that your brother has? Lord have mercy, you would have thought it was the end of time. We could not come up with one nice thing to say. If 
finally Sayer thought of something, and so he was dismissed from the table. But Sutherland sat for about 20 minutes before he would admit anything nice or good about his brother. Unfortunately, those kinds of things simmer over into adulthood. We see complicated relationships because siblings forced to share attention from parents, forced to share personal space and items and reputations and friends, often compared and contrasted. And then the problems get worse as the issues get bigger. What to do about our aging parents? How to share the inheritance? How do we bridge these chasms that have been there for so long? One of my favorite scriptures, and one that I think speaks well to all these types of situations, is from Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Which is all well and good. We can act that way and live that way until we get to talking about our siblings, right? You see, God created us to be in relationship with each other, to live in harmony together. And that even includes living peaceably with our siblings. The same rules apply to those relationships as to any others we have with followers of Christ. We need to bridge gaps in strained relationships with siblings or with others by doing the things listed above, such as treating one another with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Ugh, tough call, huh? How do we find it in us to treat those who may have wronged us in such a way? It is important to see God at work. Just as Joseph saw God at work through everything, he was able to have compassion on his brothers in their time of need because of the difficult circumstances he had been through. And he realized that God had seen him through. He was able to be patient with their devious acts from years past because he knew that a good outcome had come from it. Joseph was able to see more than just that one action of what his brothers had tried to do. We too are able to see past those things that have caused broken relationships because the Holy Spirit lives in us and brings us the power to be compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, and patient with other people, even with our siblings, to love one another. Forgive. Oh, let me do anything but that, right? Because God has forgiven us, we are called to forgive others. Even those things that we say, yeah, but what about, you know, my boys can always come up with something. Well, you need to forgive your brother. Well, yeah, but he did this. Yeah, 
how but that? How can I do that? Forgiveness is a huge part of healing strained relationships. Those things that we may carry from younger siblings into adulthood. We have to be willing to let go of the resentment, the hurtful things that have been a part of the past in order to move forward. If forgiveness is not found, healing cannot take place. Love. Sibling love? Uh, yes, my boys displayed it last night, didn't they? When you truly love someone, as we know from many relationships, it is sometimes more important to be in relationship than it is to be right. You know, they, they say that's the worst feeling in the world and when you're in the middle of an argument and you realize you're wrong. Oh, no. We love to be right, don't we? But that's the source of a lot of our problems. When we are right and another person is wrong, by golly, why can't you see it my way and know that I'm right? We have to let love rule. Even with being right sounds like a lot of fun. Sometimes in our siblings, as well as our other relationships, we choose to love. Even if the other person doesn't do things the way we would want. Or we think is right. Joseph chose to love his brothers, despite their actions toward him. He was more concerned about renewing the relationships than he was about being self-righteous. He had plenty of reason to be indignant about what they had done, but he chose to have a relationship with them instead. Our scripture from Colossians also reminds us to seek peace, to be thankful, to encourage one another. Renewing damaged relationships is an intentional rebuilding process. Putting back together things that have been pulled apart. It is critical and necessary to forgive and to love, but the relationship will not grow and thrive if we don't actively seek peace together. If we are not engaging each other positively. Being thankful for the gift of the relationship and giving each other encouraging and positive words. That's what we were trying to do last night with our boys, to help them see something in each other that they could appreciate. I'm sure they didn't get down inside. It was just a little painful to have to say it out loud. So maybe today, you're sitting here thinking about the relationship between Joseph and his brothers. And thinking, you know, some of my family relationships could use some work. I encourage you to start mending those relationships right now, today. Because the famine will come. Times will be hard ahead. And if your relationship is not already positive and encouraging, it will be more and more difficult. Suddenly you will find yourself, if you're not already the oldest living generation, if you don't have strong relationships with your siblings, it's going to be a rocky road in dealing with these things. Do everything you can to make sure that you and your family members aren't torn apart by the challenges that lay ahead. Pray for them. Seek peace. Forgive. Love and courage. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, woohoo, I'm off the hook for today because I have great relationships with my family. We're all good. Everything's good. Or maybe you're like me and going, you know what? I'm an only child. No problem. <laughs> this is wonderful. I came to church and I don't have to worry about anything. Well, guess what? We got something for you too. Because everybody here brothers and sisters. I uh, told my first service, you know, I said my mom has three siblings. One of her brothers is named Bob. One day we were in the little store uh, in my hometown and her brother walked in 
And my mom said, well, hello, Brother Bob. And somebody said, is that your preacher? And she said, no, he's my brother. <laughs> but you know, we are all sisters and brothers. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. We are part of one family. Does anybody that you go to church with annoy you? Please don't answer that out loud. <laughs> but think about it. Is there anybody, and not just in this church, but think about our brothers and sisters around the world, all of those who profess Christ, all of those who God loves, are our brothers and our sisters. You know, some Christians like to act as if this is their motto. Jesus loves everybody, but I'm his favorite. Yeah, we see that a lot. Not, what can I do to serve my brother or sister, but how can I come to church and have my needs met? How can I have my favorite songs played? How can I hear my favorite scriptures read? It's not about our brothers and our sisters. Some people find judgment very easy to hand out to others. But you know, I don't read anything in Joseph's story, where he held something over his brother's heads, I read a story of compassion and love. I don't hear Colossians say anything about being judgmental or indifferent to one another. I don't think those are the things that we need to do with our Christian brothers and sisters. It's time to realize that but how we live in relationship with each other speaks volumes about what kind of God we believe in. How we treat each other shows the rest of the world who God is and what God is about. If people see us treating one another in ways that are loving, respectful, peaceful and encouraging, that might just be enough to bring them into the fellowship of the church. So if you don't have any family members on which to practice these principles, you can practice on all of us, your brothers and sisters in Christ. In an article by Elizabeth Bernstein from the Wall Street Journal, she tells a story of Al Golden, age 85. He chokes up when he talks about his twin brother, Elliot, who died three years ago. The brothers shared a room growing up in Brooklyn, New York, graduated from the City Maritime College in New York, and married within a month of each other in 1947. Yet Mr. Golden remembers how their father compared their grades, asking one or the other, how come you got to be and your brother got an A? He rarely missed a chance to point out that Elliot wasn't as good as Alan swimming. When the boys were ready to get married, he suggested a double wedding. Mr. Golden put his foot down. I share every birthday my bar mitzvah with my brother. He said, I'll be doggone if I'm going to share my wedding as well. Elliot Golden became a lawyer and eventually a state Supreme Court judge. Al Golden went into the mirror business and sold life insurance. He says he always envied his brother's status and secretly took pleasure in knowing he was a better fisherman and had a bigger boat. Once, Elliot asked him, I'm a lawyer. How come you make more money than me? <coughs> Mr. Golden said what he meant was, how come you're making more than me when you're not as successful? But it did feel good. One day, Mr. Golden said, Elliot accused him of not doing enough to take care of their ailing mother. After the conversation, Mr. Golden didn't speak to his brother for more than a year. It might have been the buildup of jealousies over the years, he said. His brother repeatedly reached out to him, as did his nieces and nephews, but Mr. Golden ignored them. Then one day, Mr. Golden received an email from his brother telling a story about two men who had a stream dividing their property. One man hired a carpenter to build a fence along the stream, but the carpenter built a bridge by mistake. 
Mr. Goldman thought about that email. Then he wrote back, I'd like to walk over that bridge. I missed him, Mr. Goldman says now. I never had the chance to miss him before. Today I ask you, are you ready to walk over that bridge to mend the relationship in your life that's been broken? Are you ready to encourage, to forgive, to love, to seek peace? Joseph did so. May we find the strength to follow his example so that our brothers and sisters, both in our families and in our church, <coughs> might see the light of Christ in us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray.